1939, a psychological experiment was quietly brewing in an orphanage. One so disturbing that those who knew of it dared only whisper its nickname, the Monster Study. 22 orphan children became unwitting subjects in a psychological experiment about stuttering. But none of these children had given consent. In fact, they had no idea they were part of the study at all. What happened to them was kept hidden for decades. And when the truth finally emerged, it sent shockwaves through the scientific community. How did a respected university professor come to be involved in something so cruel that it was likened to a monster? And why would anyone ever experiment on vulnerable orphans in the first place? Today, we are talking about the chilling backstory of The Monster Study, a tale of psychological manipulation, beliefs, secrecy, and lessons learned far too late. This is one of the most interesting studies I've ever read, and it's a good study on the power of nature versus nurture. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and let's begin. Imagine being a child who speaks normally, only to be told over and over again that you are developing a terrible stutter. Like what would that do to a child's mind? And especially at a developmental age where the mind is so malleable. Well, this is exactly what a group of orphans endured as part of the monster study. This study was so frowned upon that it was hidden for 60 years. The experiment's aim was to unlock the mysteries of stuttering by testing a very radical theory. In the 1930s, speech pathologist Dr. Wendell Johnson was determined to find the cause of stuttering. I mean, after all, he himself struggled with stuttering since childhood. So this all started with a well-meaning cause. He proposed a daring idea. What if stuttering isn't something you're born with, but something created by other people's reactions? For example, if a child had speech impairment or struggled with words, how the parents reacted to that would play a huge role. A big reaction with a huge correction would subconsciously communicate to the child that, hey, yeah, maybe I do have something wrong with the way I speak. Wendell Johnson believed that labelling a child as a stutterer would make them a stutterer, even if that child wasn't one to begin with. He stated that stuttering begins not in the child's mouth, but in the parent's ear. In other words, as mentioned earlier, the problem might lie in how we respond to a child's normal speech mistakes. By being critical or overly concerned, we might actually cause the very stuttering. So to test this theory, Johnson Johnson designed an experiment that would be as ambitious as it was ethically ambiguous. Wendell Johnson, along with his 22-year-old graduate student Mary Tudor, devised a plan. They would take children who spoke normally and convince them that they had a stutter, essentially trying to induce stuttering through negative speech therapy. Conversely, they would take children who actually stuttered and shower them with positive reinforcement, trying to see if praise and reassurance could diminish a real stutter. And this this kind of reminds me of the rice experiment where you have two jars of rice, one jar you shower with love and words of affirmation and praise, like literally every morning you say, I love you, and on the other hand, you would say spiteful things to the other jar, like I hate you, you are a bad, bad jar of rice, you. The jar that you speak negative words to or convey negative energy to will actually begin to grow more, while the love jar would be completely fine. I personally haven't tried this experiment, but if this is real and we we can visibly see the effects on mere grains of rice, imagine what it could do to a child's mind. I strongly believe that our words have immense power and what we say to kids can and will have a lasting impact and we'll soon find out how far Wendell Johnson and Mary Tudor would go to prove this theory. The experiment subjects would be drawn from a large orphanage in Iowa. By choosing orphans, Wendell and Mary avoided the need to get parental consent, which is unfortunately quite a common but troubling practice in the 1930s. These children, ranging from 5 to 15 years old, were told that they were getting speech therapy from a university. And even the staff at the orphanage believed this, and the stage was set for an experiment that would be condemned as one of the most unethical in psychology. In January 1939, Mary Tudor began visiting the orphanage, armed with a notebook and a rehearsed script. She had selected 22 children. 10 of them had mild stutters, or at least had been labelled stutters by orphanage staff, and 12 had no stutter at 
all. The children were then divided into four groups. Group 1A was labelled, you are just fine. This first group consisted of five children who actually stuttered and they were told that their speech was perfectly fine. Mary would reassure these kids by saying, you will outgrow it. You speak very well. Good job. She was basically instructed to use positive encouragement to help better their condition. The second group, group 1B, was labelled, yes, you stutter. This second group was a control group. Five children who stuttered were told that yes, their speech was as bad as people say. These kids were subjected to more critical traditional speech therapy approach that highlighted their flaws. The third group, group 2A, was labelled, you're developing a stutter. Six children who spoke normally and were fluent speakers were told that something was very wrong with their speech. And Mary had a very chilling script. It read, you have many of the symptoms of a child who is beginning to stutter. You must try to stop yourself immediately. Don't ever speak unless you can do it right. And that last sentence is personally very chilling to me. Like you're basically telling a kid not to speak at all unless you are sure and 100% confident that you can say it right. Imagine how nervous and anxious a child would be upon hearing this even if that child is speaking perfectly fine. And like I said, these were kids who spoke perfectly fine but were pressured into thinking that something was very wrong with the way they spoke. They were essentially convinced that they were becoming stutterers and were warned not to speak unless they could avoid this imaginary defect. And the fourth group, group 2B, was labelled keep up the good speech. This remaining six children who were all fluent served as a positive control group. They were told that their speech was great and received compliments on how well they spoke. So basically, no changes. So the big question remains, can mere words turn a carefree kid into a stutterer? Well, Mary Tudor was about to find out. During her visits, which lasted for five months, she spent 45 minutes with each child every few weeks in a small office in the orphanage. For the non-stuttering kids in group 2A, Mary's tone was grave and concerned. She would lower her voice and say, we've noticed you have a lot of trouble speaking. She would then point to a boy in another group who actually stuttered and say, see that boy over there who can't get his words out? He stuttered out just like you. And like I said, imagine hearing this from a trusted adult. Those words must have been terrifying. But that was exactly the point of the monster study. To answer the cruel question, could telling a child they are defective actually make them so? In a nutshell, half of the children, whether they actually started or not, were subjected to heavy criticism and negative reinforcement about their speech. And it didn't take long for signs of psychological distress to appear in these children. In fact, the transformation in some of the children was almost immediate. Mary noted how a five-year-old girl named Norma Jean changed within weeks. This child was once very talkative and expressive, but all of a sudden, Norma hardly spoke at all. Mary wrote, It was very difficult to get her to speak, although she spoke very freely the month before. And that is just so heartbreaking, man. Like, the child's future and confidence just shattered like that. Another child, nine-year-old Betty, who had no speech issues before, began refusing to talk and would cover her face with her hands in embarrassment when pressured to talk. Another child, 15-year-old Hazel, developed a painful self-consciousness about every word she spoke. She started speaking less and less, and in frustration, she even started snapping her fingers whenever she got stuck on a word. When Mary gently asked Hazel why she kept using filler words like um, and ass before speaking, Hazel replied, because I'm afraid I can't say the next word. <sighs> and that's honestly so heartbreaking, man. I'm... I'm about to cry. Poor Hazel. And how the hell does Mary even continue to do this for months, man? Like, knowingly f up a child's life like that. Hazel clearly has perpetual fear and anxiety about speaking, constantly worried that she would stumble with her words. And the scariest thing is, it's all just in her head. And an adult convinced her so. She was a teenager who had no serious speech problems before, but was made to feel like every sentence was a trap. And all of Group 2A, the normal kids who were told that they had a stutter, began to show similar signs of distress. Their schoolwork suffered because they withdrew from class participation. And one boy flat out refused to recite in front of the class anymore. Another boy, 11-year-old Clarence, became so nervous that he would start correcting himself mid-sentence, doubting every word he spoke. Then there was 12-year-old Mary Korlaski, one of the most fluent orphans who was wrongly told that she had a stutter. Mary became withdrawn and emotionally volatile after these sessions. When asked if her best friend knew about her stuttering, Mary quietly said no, adding, I hardly ever talked to her. And this was 
was her best friend, what kind of a mental block must a 12 year old have to hardly ever talk to her best friend? The experiment induced so much shame and fear in her that it was literally silencing her. In fact, Mary's distress eventually drove her to desperate action. Two years later, in 1941, Mary along with another girl from the experiment ran away from the orphanage. After six months of this therapy, it was clear that the negative labels had harmed these children. Many of the kids who were told they had bad speech now exhibited classic symptoms of stuttering or extreme self-consciousness. And it would later be discovered that some of these effects lasted a lifetime. But did the researchers realize what they had done? And would they try to undo this nightmare they had created? Well, Mary sort of did. She saw that her experiment was slowly hurting children. And it was documented that as the study went on, the more uneasy she felt. When the orphanage staff started noticing that children who were previously bright and outgoing became quiet and reserved, they reached out to Wendell Johnson for help. Johnson in turn asked Mary to go back to the orphanage to try to repair the damage with positive therapy. But did it work? Mary did return to the orphanage three times, in fact, after the official experiment ended. But this time, she showered the children only with praise and kindness, essentially telling the children the opposite of what she had said before. Unfortunately, the negative seeds had already been planted. In a letter to Wendell Johnson, Mary confessed that the children were not recovering as quickly as she had hoped. She wrote, I believe that in time they will recover, but we certainly made a definite impression on these children. But little did she know that it was more than just a definite impression. The truth was, some of the children's speech had deteriorated alarmingly, especially Clarence and Hazel, who now stuttered or stumbled far more than before. Mary tried her best to undo the experiment's effects, but as she later lamented, she couldn't provide enough positive therapy to fully reverse the harm. The psychological scars were already hardened. Mary eventually moved away and started her career as a speech therapist elsewhere. In her later work in schools, Mary focused focused only on positive reinforcement, encouraging children gently, a direct result of what she had witnessed in the monster experiment. But what about the mastermind of this study, Dr. Wendell Johnson? Well, he had proof for his theory, evidence that labeling a child a stutterer can and will induce stuttering behaviors. Yet, he also knew that this evidence came at an unethical price, so Johnson made a fateful choice. He never mentioned the monster study in any of his subsequent writings or lectures, but he supported the evidence from his study with other, less direct evidence. For example, he advised parents to ignore a child's small speech impairment rather than react negatively, which indeed became a cornerstone of stuttering therapy. His idea that adult reactions cause a child's stutter was widely accepted, and it did arguably help change parenting and therapy for the better. But if Wendell Johnson hit the monster study, how did this study come to light? Fast forward 62 years from the time of the experiment, and we come to Jim Dyer, a journalist who received a tip-off that deep within the archives of the University of Iowa lies a long, buried, unpublished study on orphan kids. He found Mary Tudor's thesis in 1939 about the monster study and its effects on children. And the story went wild. He even contacted some of the kids from the experiment who were now all in their 80s, telling them that they were all part of an experiment on stuttering back in 1939. And naturally, many of them were horrified and heartbroken. And rightfully so. I mean, imagine spending your entire life believing that you were just a naturally shy person with a tendency to stumble over words. But now, you find out that your lifelong self-consciousness about speaking was an outcome of an experiment you were unaware of when you were a child. That must have been so mind-boggling, man. Like, what? I thought this was just my natural demeanor. Seven of the victims of the monster study were eventually awarded $925,000. This was split among those who had been in the negative therapy groups. It's worth noting that none of the children actually developed a full-fledged stutter, but many had their self-confidence crushed and became deeply self-conscious. And I honestly find this study so interesting. It's not the worst human study I've read about. I mean, Unit 731 is way worse. But it's still interesting because we have real evidence 
that positive or negative affirmations can and will affect someone's upbringing. On one hand, Wendell Johnson and Mary Tudor were complicit in a horrifying experiment. But on the other, the evidence collected helped thousands if not millions of people with speech impairment. So was it worth the damage done to these kids? Well, that's up to you to decide. But if there's anything we can take away from this is that as mentors, parents and authoritative figures, how we speak to our youths will greatly impact their trajectory in life. I'm not calling for everyone to be softies and snowflakes. I do believe that discipline and hardship carve character. But perhaps we can take note of the words that we use and how we react to our children's shortcomings. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, consider subscribing and liking this video. It really helps the channel out. And I'll see you guys very soon. Peace. Bye bye.